Prime Same Channel next week for another Monday Dump. See you there. Oh, Hello, Australia. Welcome to the Monday Dump for another week, Roy. It's been an incredible weekend. Uh, you know, I don't know where to begin, really. I, 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 I am breathless with excitement. Breathless? Yes. I can accept that. HCI had a wonderful weekend. I slipped over to wonderful, wonderful Copenhagen uh -huh. uh, for the Eurovision Song Contest. Actually, and I, and I, I met up with two of my very, very good friends, that is Natasha Cronje and Soren Pilmark. Yes, how were they? And they were marvellous people. <laughs> marvellous presenters. Yeah. And they, they, they did some very cunning and, I think, funny things mm. uh, with rhyming couplets. Let's have a look at a little bit of their work now, yes. uh, the great uh, Natasha and Soren. You've got five Soren. minutes to call and give your vote to the song you like, best of them all. On your TV screens, the numbers will appear, so you cannot vote in here. Ah, all ah, over ah, Europe, ah. people begin to wonder who's going to win. This song? Maybe, but that song should not. <laughs> yes, here's one that didn't win. Uh, Swedish entry, Roy. Yes. And uh, let's face it, uh, Benny this and Bjorn called, right there. Yes, it's called Listen to Your Heartbeat. It's very fresh, very new, and the band is called Friends. Yeah. And they do owe a little bit, I think, to uh, the great Abba. You've only got to half close your eyes, you can see Benny and Bjorn. Yeah. I'd say it only borrowed from them 100%. I'd say so. Uh, yeah. Basically, I think they could safely sue, and there would be no court in Sweden that would deny them the royalties of this song. Exactly. I agree with you. On and the other where does hand, it go from there, Roy? On the other hand, the winners, HG, that is um, Tanel Padar and Dave Benton and 2XL with the song Everybody. And they're, they're from Estonia. And I just love this song. Do you? Why do you like it? Doesn't get you going? Yeah, I suppose so. Hey? Uh, well, I don't think it's as good as Congratulations. Which one? No, but it's, it's funky. It's got a funky. Oh. Come on, everybody. Can you feel the beat? Here's the, here's the result. Oh, here. yeah, the result. Yeah. Estonia 198. They, they just blew everyone away. Yeah. And very excited. They are very talented, that, that pair. They'll really kick on. Uh, and 38,000 people crammed into the hall there, uh, yeah. the King of Denmark Auditorium. I don't know what Danish people do apart from go to Eurovision Song Contest, but it was tremendous to see them all of Denmark gathered in one room. I would love to see a, uh, say, a Pacific, Asia Pacific. Rim yeah. song competition. Oh, yeah. Where would the entries come from? They come from all over Asia. Like Fiji. And Fiji and Western Samoa. Yeah. And Guam yeah. and the United States, probably, and China. Yeah. Um, we'd probably, obviously, you'd have to have some standards here. You'd have to say Why? each, well, each nation should at least have an air force, in which case New Zealand wouldn't be able to enter. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. That is a standard. It now, is a standard. Now, I'd like to welcome tonight uh, to the Monday Dump uh, members of the Ambulance Driver Service uh, in oh, yes. uh, New South Wales. Oh, yes. They've had a bit of a runabouts lately, and so we've invited them along to cheer them up. Isn't that great? It is good, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. And so uh, that's, if anybody does feel poorly in the audience, then they're in safe hands. Because they know all that uh, Sylvester Broche. Do they? Mouth to mouth. Oh, yes. Kiss yes. of life. Kiss of life. Yeah, do they carry that. the jaws of death in the ambulance? I, I suppose they do. Yes. No, they're terrific people. We yeah. might try and get sick later on and see what they do. <laughs> <laughs> now, look. One story that's causing a lot of talk across uh, Australia at the moment is the Lithgow Panther. Uh, Roy, this one's right out of the box. I can't remember anything like this for about a thousand years. Uh, it's a huge cat. A huge cat. It's so bloody big, people are terrified. All through Lithgow, they're, you know, they're in their houses banging up bits of plywood to keep the cat out. We've got some pictures here of the cat, Roy. Look at this thing, it's lurking. Look how quickly it moves. It's just huge. It's, the scale is uncanny there. I make it two metres tall at the shoulder. There it is lurking up a laneway there. Yeah. Pictures of yeah. people scared, taking pictures from their kitchen windows down back lanes. It's a tremendously fearsome sight, and it moves so quickly. Now, Roy, obviously people are out there with the guns, spotlights, hoping to get a sniff of it. Yeah. What are your do's and don'ts when approaching a bloody big cat like that? Well, it's a dangerous animal for a start, yes. HG. Oh, yes. uh, if you see it, don't move. Uh -huh. Don't make any noise. Oh, yeah. And make sure you haven't got any uncooked meat on you. <laughs> <laughs> On the other hand, a bit of uncooked meat would come into its own. Yeah. Cause you'd just hurl it, yeah. wouldn't you? And you'd think it's a bit pretty stupid. You'd go to the uncooked meat and then you'd duck off. Uh. But uh, my feeling is, HG, that it probably is, it belongs to an ancient species uh. that goes back to the time when the Wallamai pine oh, yeah. was, 
first was planted. first planted, uh, yes. Uh, that is just after the last ice age. <laughs> and uh, scientists have come up with what it might look like, really. If uh -huh. we can have a look at it here, you get a bit of an idea. And there you've got a Logie there to compare it size-wise. <laughs> so that gives you a bit of an idea. <laughs> so uh, here it is. It's, there's the Logie there's there. The Logie it's there. huge. Look how huge. bloody big yeah. that Logie is. Yeah. I mean, that's enormous <laughs> there. I mean, that's mm. incredible. Yeah, I know. I know. It's a look. bloody big, fearsome, bloody creature. Uh, and they're out there. Are they? So I would advise... Belly fellow. <laughs> I would advise anyone in the Blue Mountains area, in the Lithgow area, to stay indoors. Mm. Stay mm. indoors. Should you warn people that you're after the big panther, just to let them know that if you don't turn up in four or five days, they should assume you're dead and eat them? <laughs> I'd certainly let the St John's Ambulance Band ambulance people know, HG, and probably the police. Mm. But uh, it's marvellous to think those creatures are still out there. Uh, and uh, I'm hoping it'll encourage a lot of kids to get out exploring. Uh, <laughs> what, with a slug gun? Well, just <laughs> hoping to wing it. I don't know, strictly speaking, that's legal. Uh, but, uh, no, no, just go out with ropes and that sort of thing. Nets. Nets. Mm. Yeah, wouldn't it be great to come back with one of those? Mm. You know, it's probably just like the thylacine, like the Tasmanian tiger. Oh, yeah. Right. They're out there. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's just no one sees them. No. Now, the great news is in rugby league circles that Hopper's back. Uh, look, this man has done so much for rugby league. He has put rugby league on the front pages of the Washington Post, the Sun newspaper in Britain, the Greenland Trumpet and Bugle, the Ulla Dollar <laughs> Weekly. He has put it everywhere. A man yeah. who has made rugby league the sport the world, it's being described as the sleeping giant of world sport rugby league. He has made the sport, the must see sport, the must play sport, the must do sport in the world. And uh, here he is unfortunately working on a building site, doesn't know much about lifting a bag of concrete. He's the one on the left there. Yeah. And the bloke on the right's got a bit of grasp of the skills. He hasn't got a bloody clue, has he? No, he's, he's going to do his back in. But here he is in action on the field here. And here he is, uh, look, just trying to slow the play the ball up in the most attractive fashion there. And those are the sort of pictures that got rugby league world attention. And it is good news to think that a number of rugby league clubs are prepared to take a chance with Hopper again. They are, HG. I think he's been uh, sent a lifeline by a number of clubs uh, in the United Kingdom. Yes. Uh, Castleford, Bradford, Wigan, mm. uh, the London Broncos. Uh, I think just about every team is interested in having Hopper. Uh, because he gets people talking rugby league again. Oh, That's what I like about it. Yes. And uh, let's face it, uh, finger men have always done very, very well <laughs> in the United Kingdom. <laughs> Uh, it's it's a, a technique that they pioneered many, many years ago, yeah. and Hopper is reviving a very much an old skill. Uh. Uh, certainly, whenever the Brits came out here years, years ago, when you have to, used to have, uh, you know, the British lines coming out here, mm. I mean, you'd wear butt plugs or anything just to, uh, <laughs> keep, keep, just to keep, them at, uh, keep, keep them at bay. But I think it's terrific. I, uh, I think it's terrific. Uh, because it is encouraging people to think of, uh, you know, proctology as an occupation. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's getting people going into surgeries and bending over and saying, Doc, can you have a look? and see yeah. what's happening up yeah. there. Yeah. You know, I'm a bit confused. Uh, yeah. Is there anything wrong? Yes. Yeah. Am I clean? Yeah. No, I think it's great. And, and Hopper, welcome back. And if, um, you know, Hopper's techniques and rugby league have travelled a happy, happy path over many, many years, uh, I was going to say marijuana on cricket haven't been strangers, uh, well, for very long in the circles of cricket. Uh, certainly uh, this week, uh, a number of South African cricketers has appeared to have been uh, caught with the green in uh, in the West Indies. Yeah. Uh, Roy, uh, this story, no surprises to you? No surprises to me, HG. It's, uh, look, when you're in the West Indies, as you know and I know, uh, you can't go anywhere without a big bloody spliff coming your way. <laughs> and often it would be rude to say no. Uh, rude uh, to say no. Uh, uh, I know you and I, whenever we've been there uh, with the ABC commentary team, you know, Jim Maxwell and co, and I know I'm not telling any stories, you know, uh, Greg, Greg Matthew, well, you know, the whole... We just got off our faces for the best part. <laughs> Five weeks. Oh, five weeks, and uh, I, I have no memories of, of the last no, three right. tours <laughs> to the West Indies. Uh, I just know I had a bloody good time, yeah. and all the photographs just had me grinning. Yeah. Yeah. Having a great time. In a smoke haze, mate. Yes, yeah, that's, yeah. Right. That's, that, right. that's what's fabulous about it. And I think it's wrong to punish It's a cultural exchange. Yes, that's right. You go there to find out about what happens in, say, the parks that you're touring to, right? Yes, yeah, yeah. It doesn't help you cricket, but... No, uh, no. separate problem. <laughs> separate problem. Now, we've got an internet poll tonight, obviously, as a regular feature on the Monday Dump, and the internet poll concerns the bloody big cat. Yes, the big, the, what, what we call it, the, the Lithgow Panther. The Lithgow Panther. Yes, the Lithgow Panther, A, sounds really dangerous. Yes. B, sounds really interesting. Yes. C, sounds really ancient. Yes. D, sounds like rubbish. <laughs> and that's the Monday Dump, dot i7, dot com, dot au. Get involved. Yes, get polling now, and we'll be back with more Dump, right? 
right after this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> When Noel Campbell attacked the head of an opponent in the Group 9 Grand Final of 1957, he broke his own arm. He also broke the nose of his opposing second rower, Barry Coit, caused a depressed cheekbone fracture and such severe concussion that it had him in hospital under observation for three weeks. At the time, Coit was being earmarked for country first selection and missed out through injury. But far from being enemies, Coit went on to become best man at Noel's wedding. The two haven't seen each other since 1960. Noel doesn't know it, but the man he's about to meet is none other than his old football sparring partner and best man, Barry Coy. Those reunions are tremendous. They're putting a lot of joy back in them. It's just a little way of the dump saying, uh, putting thanks back into the 100 years that we're celebrating this year with yeah. the Centenary of Federation. Bar and think... Barry and Noel had a lovely night, didn't they? They did. They did. Barry uh, Coit, what a great player. <laughs> <laughs> and what was nice was the ambulances had to come at a, after about 20 minutes uh, after we left them. And, uh, <laughs> That's right. it, it was just on uh, exactly the same as if they were still playing rugby league. It was tremendous. <laughs> and we did get an email, and I'm sorry I can't acknowledge the uh, person who wrote the email, wondering if we could link up Wayne Johnston the Carlton half forward of about 1982 and the streaker of the 1982 grand final. <laughs> and we will be trying to get those two together uh, on the show later on. That's tremendous. And Greg Chappell and the streaker who he whacked on the bottom with his back. <laughs> What's well, it going to be a streaker? Yeah, yeah. It'd be good to get those two together again. <laughs> We're working double, on it. We're working on it. On a double bunger. Yeah. Uh, now, Roy, uh, this week, of course, I've never felt so proud to be an Australian. Sure, it's easy to be proud when you're here or, you know, representing Australia, say, at the uh, Eurovision Song Contest, but at Cannes, that's the <laughs> really big, that's one of the really big ones that you feel proud to be Australian at and we're lucky enough to be there to see some fantastic scenes of unparalleled excitement when Moulin Rouge oh. uh, went before the judges at Cannes and we go now to those marvellous pictures. Yeah. The bean back, here's Nicole, the star of the show with obviously Root in the background, here's the uh, director Baz Luhrmann there and they're getting on like houses on fire and you can feel the excitement, can't you? You can feel the excitement oozing. And look the pride. At the pride, yeah. I had my pants off for yes, most of the time. Then we go to the film. Then we go to the... Well, that's what you're doing, Cunt. Then we go to the film. And look at these scenes here. Magnificent scenes of Moulin Rouge. And, uh, oh, I don't know what you can say about it, Roy. It just brings everything that Moulin Rouge, not that I'm quite sure what it stood for, back to life. I, think I suppose it does, actually. Uh, I mean, Nicole is there. She's sultry. She's talented. Uh, Ewan McGregor, of course. Uh, she's subsequently said that uh, the two of them haven't had uh, anything going, uh, you know, between the cheat style, and it's all above board. Right. Do you believe it? <laughs> no, I don't. No. I don't believe it. No. Good. But I like you, H.G., I'm a little bit confused. Is it, is it the Moulin Rouge that we associate uh, with uh, Toulouse-Lautrec? Mm -hmm. You know, the little bloke who... Uh, had one leg. Like, do you, do, was it only one leg? <laughs> I thought he had two legs, but they were sort of stumpy. Oh, could it be? <laughs> I thought he had stumpy little legs. He's yeah. a little bloke, a bit like, a bit like Tom. Yeah, well... A bit like be. Tom Cruise, about the same height. <laughs> Real little mm. bloke, uh, except he used to like daubing. Hey, painted. And he painted. And he painted the Can Can girls from the Moulin Rouge Club in Montmartre. Mm. Is that what it's about? Oh, don't ask me. I, I, I was only there for the pre. Right. The pre. Uh, I wasn't allowed to go in and look at the film. Right. They kept me out. Oh, no, OK. Yeah, because I'm a pride. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I was just yeah. So, no, no, so I understand. Proud. I understand. <clears throat> well, I'm confused. Because if, is it, if, is it, if it is the old Moulin Rouge, it looks a bit modern. Oh, yeah. And it sounds a bit modern. It does. I mean, is Baz trying to... Well, pull what, one fuse over. the new and the old or something? Yeah, probably. A bit like, uh, what, Romeo plus Juliet. Yes, yes, that was his previous film. Anyway, look, we leave that there. But it's look, exciting. It's exciting, and we look forward to it. I mean, it's unfathomable to me. I don't get it. Mm. But it's exciting. Yes. Now, speaking of excitement, it's very, very hard to go past wood chopping for sheer, unadulterated <laughs> excitement. I, I don't know what it is about wood and blokes. <laughs> and a sharp axe. Now, Roy, just before we go to this magnificent coverage of a, a recent chop-off, uh, how do you see getting kids involved in wood chopping? Actually, I think you've got to start by getting them a tomahawk mm. at a very young age mm. and treating them uh, and explaining to them how, how useless mm. timber is unless it's being chopped up. <laughs> you know, nothing annoys me more than just seeing a tree. Mm. <laughs> I hate it. Mm. it I, you know, I just, you know... You I'm want to get along, into it? Sometimes I'm driving along, you know, so be, say between here and Goulburn, or, you know, mm. even if I go, it doesn't matter which way you go. Mm. They're bloody everywhere. <laughs> you know, and it drives me berserk. Mm. 
I just want to stop and get the axe out of the boot and just <laughs> jump get up. in there. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, just that... <laughs> mm. Mm. clear. Mm. Mm. That's when I'd be happy. Mm. Well, what I don't like is those trees, and you see them lurking about the River Murray and so on, that do this to you as you go by. <laughs> I mean, that's what really gets up my nose. And you know those what? Those stupid leafless trees. Those leafless trees that are underwater. They're still doing that to I you. I know. Even though they're Get dead. Your nose. I know, that's right. Just now, forget to you. You know, when I was a kid with a tomahawk, I was lucky enough to have no trees anywhere near, so I attacked the local weeds. Things like Patterson's Curse, Salvation Jane. I should just chop that down. Yeah. Just get my hand in. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, no, no, no doubt about it. Well, let's go to... Anything high, anything above anything. <laughs> <laughs> get rid of That's what I say to kids. Yeah. You see anything above anything? Wah! <laughs> That's right. Let's have a look at some wood chopping now. This is exciting pictures. Yes, hello everyone and welcome to the Charlie Moses Wood Chop Arena at uh, Homebush in Sydney. Uh, we've got a tremendous card lined up, Roy, for uh, commentary. And I go goosey whenever I see big lumps of wood staring skywards, begging for an axe. Who's up first? <laughs> Actually, this is your tree felling, and this is for people like uh, Matthew Gurr and Mitchell Hewitt, Lindsay Hewitt, the Queensland boys, the Queensland Connection, uh, as we call them. And uh, Dale Beams, a real quality field. And these are people that hate tall things, especially timber. They hate timber. And they're underway now. And what they have to do is cut these uh, slots into yeah. these big bowls yeah. and put the plank in so as they can elevate themselves. Yeah. And then once they're up the top, they whack away at one side, then they come down and they do it all again. It's an exciting competition, isn't it, Roy, as it we is. see Matthew Gurr close to on screen, looks to be in the lead at the moment. He does, and it's fraught with danger, HG. I mean, you've really got to know your wood, you've got to hate your wood, you've got to know your axe, you've got to trust your axe, and you've got to make a bloody good wedge. And there's a bloke who's got his axe stuck! I'd disqualify yourself and say, yeah. I'm a goose, I give well, up. I hate you, mate. And here comes uh, Matthew, down he comes. Yeah. Now he's got to do it the other way. Yeah. And of course, if you don't trust your wedge, you can get a fall. Yeah. And I think we've got a fall up at the top end there, Roy. I don't yeah, know whether yeah, you yeah, saw yeah, that. Do. I saw out that. Of the, out of the edge, uh, eyesight. Here's the kid, picking himself up, right grin i'm a goose i'm stupid all i can do is disqualify myself as we see there on replay yeah. uh, the lad coming down yeah. meanwhile matthew well out in front i think by this stage here he is uh as we see another competitor coming down matthew will be up the top of the block swinging here we go here we go take us through these final strokes roy right well he's got to come down from the top at you make this wedge a little bit higher so he can really just knock it over topple it towards the end as we call it toppling the tree and uh, look at that, uh, he really knows and hates and loathes his wood. Uh, doesn't he get excited about seeing a bit of hardwood yeah. skywards? Yeah, splinters flying, chips everywhere. He just wants to leave clear felling, just a mess. That's <laughs> all. It's just bush junk, isn't it? It's just rubbish. <laughs> just get rid of it, it. Knock it down. Well done, Matthew Gurr. A bloke who's knocked over more... As you give us the helicopter there, that's yeah. how he gets down. A bloke who's knocked over more trees than Dave Foster. And that's saying something, isn't it? It is. Speaking of Dave Foster, actually, I think he's coming up a little later on. And what a marvellous feather in the cap that is there uh, for the young Tasmanian there. And speaking of the Tasmanian connection, we've got the Foster Brothers coming up, HG, I think... Uh, Right after this, right results after this. in the uh, tree felling. Matthew Kerr, Mitchell Hewitt and Mitchell McKenzie. Hats off to those three blokes there. Now we go to the 600 mil double-handed saw. We've got a New Zealand team. We've got Pete and Dave Foster in. We've got some Americans and Canadians in. It's a quality international field. Roy, we're almost underway. Watch the comp. You've got to saw through the uh, tree trunk as quickly as possible, HG. Uh, so it takes teamwork. I see it as a push and pull event. You've got to be used to pushing and used to pulling at the same time. Look at that. Look at Dave Foster. Look at those Foster brothers. They're pushed and pulled together. Here. You don't want to pull when you have to push, though, Roy. That's the trap for the younger player. We're underway. What's the bloke leaning over doing, though? Helping him there with the hammer. Oh, he's a chock man. It's a chock man. He just uh, separates the timber so the saws don't uh, stick. Very close finish there. New Zealand think they've got it, but well, I'd like to see a replay. I'd have. like to see a replay, Roy. I think that's too close to call. Well, Dave thinks he's out of it. I'm not calling it. I'm not calling it. We've got to go to the replay and have a look at this one. Here it is. Dave and Pete first, Daylight second, then the New Zealand combination. That's how I'm seeing it, Roy. New Zealand trying to pitch again something that doesn't belong to them here in the 600 mil uh, saw. Dave worried, but there it is. The result comes through from the uh, judges' commentary box, and that's a tremendous result for the Foster family. Yes, it is. Actually. It's been a marvellous event. Look at that, the Foster. Great, the Tasmanian connection all over New Zealand. Good chopping. Great blokes. Yes, and uh, we'd like to thank C7 for those magnificent pictures. And if you're, a, you know, if you're like ruin myself and a, a woodchop freak, then C7 have heaps of wood action uh, coming up uh, later this week. Too so, late. yeah, heaps, <laughs> heaps, heaps. <laughs> Tasman, isn't, it, isn't it great how how it's going through the roof in Tasmania? <laughs>
you know, yeah. we, you know we, we think of Tasmania, obviously, frequently, but whenever we do, <laughs> we think of their great wood chopping. Uh, and I don't know what it is. is it, have you got a lot of time on your hands and you just think, oh, what do I do today? Mm. Why don't I go out and chop? Uh, Let's have a chop. You'd phone uh, up a few mates. What are you doing this weekend? You want to have a chop? Yeah. Look, it's, much, your axe. it's a much more in, in the front of my mind down there. As soon as I wake up in the morning, I reach for the axe, I'm out there. Before I've had a cup of coffee or a fag, I'm whacking into a tree. <laughs> and I like to get a few done before I settle down for breakfast. I mean, it's right in the forefront of my mind. That's why I love C7, because often they put it on early in the morning. Mm. You can be in bed, you come to, click, 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 click. What's that sound? It's the wood chop on to C7, and I'm there. I'm happening. I'm reaching for the axe, and I'm off. Yeah. Now, uh... <clears throat> <laughs> Yeah, now that I think about it, mm. it is, uh, you know, maybe a part where they've got a few trees left. Is that right? Yeah. In Tasmania? I think so. They've got well, one or two proportionally, trees. they've got more trees, I think, than any other state. Per head of population? Per head of population. No wonder they're so annoyed down there. <laughs> There'll be more dump in a minute. <laughs> Isn't there? Yeah. Oh, no, oh, I can see. Yeah. Well, they've got a trace to do. They've got to look for the Tasmanian tiger. The news from rural and regional Australia. I'm fashion model Chloe Maxwell. Outraged pensioners appear to have thwarted an attempt to limit the number of concession tickets on a vital regional commuter service. Almost two years ago, local groups like pensioners and superannuants were celebrating news that the New South Wales state government had introduced a coach link from Bathurst to Lithgow. But last week, passengers in Bathurst were told that only 10 of them we're allowed to travel at one time at the concession rate. You really have to wonder what's going on. It's due to incompetent management as far as I could see and, and heads should roll because of this. <laughs> CountryLink has responded to the protests by putting a freeze on the new policy of limiting concession tickets. Small business in rural and regional Australia is taking another battering, this time from a colony of flying foxes. Local councils and wildlife officials are set to discuss the problem of 1,500 flying foxes turning tourists away from the Bellingen Caravan Park in northern New South Wales. Chris Mann, who leases the park, says these flying foxes are costing up to $600 a week in lost guests. A lot of people come in, and especially people with, you know, their brand new caravans and and they say, no, we can't stay here. A report calling for women to participate in armed combat has been met with a mixed response. But while it is yet to be implemented, female recruits are already learning how to handle weapons at the Kapuka Gunnery Range near Wagga Wagga in New South Wales. If the Defence Force report is adopted, Australia would become the sixth country in the world to have women in the front line but the rules of combat will come as no surprise to our soldiers. At Kapuka, women as well as men are already being trained to handle and fire powerful mini mine machine guns. I have your maximum control over it because, especially with the machine guns, they can go all over the place in one, like, in a... <laughs> a 52-year-old grandmother from the Hunter region has thrilled her family and friends by being selected to represent New South Wales in a major 10-pin bowling competition. <laughs> Cecily Walton from Glendale, New South Wales, beat players 35 years her junior to win the coveted place in the team. Amazingly, Cecily took up the sport only a decade ago. I used to up when I was about 10 year old or nine. It's something you can achieve, um, get the love out of, bowl for your state, bowl for your Australia, go overseas, oh, it would be magnificent. Cecily attributes her success to the support of her grandchildren and to the love of the game. It's just... And finally, the Eastern Market Indicator wool price of 799 cents per kilo is a drop on last week's close. And the May delivery price for Australian standard hard wheat remains steady at $162 a tonne. That's this week's news from rural and regional Australia, and I'm fashion model Chloe Maxwell. Yeah.
tremendous read there, Chloe, in very trying circumstances. Uh, look, uh, <laughs> Fashion Week, Australian Fashion Week has just finished. Yep. And uh, Alex Perry, you were working with Alex Perry. You were mm -hmm. wandering around the catwalk with Alex Perry. And yep. here we've got some footage of you in action. Uh -huh. I'd just like you to get your thoughts on, on the clothes here. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> sometimes I often think that models must get to the show and think, Christ almighty, is that what I have to wear? Is, <laughs> or God almighty, here I'd never, I said I'd never work with Alex Perry again. Here I am back <laughs> working with even less than I normally I work show on. show my boobs. Well, that's the difficulty is you did there, our cameras were there, we just haven't caught them. We weren't looking for them. I'm sorry, uh, Mark, now, I'm sorry. how did it go? How did it go? Was it an exciting week or did you think it... Uh... Yeah, I think it was very exciting. I think it gets better and better every year. I've been there since it started, yes. since the first fashion week. Yes. And I think the designers are doing so well now that they're up to international standards, even if not even better. Yes. Mm. She's a big rap, Roy. Big it, rap? It is. It's, you it's can tell I work rap. in the fashion industry. Yes, yes, yes. No, no, that, that, that's fine. Look, I, uh, I really love the Subi collection. Uh, I don't know if you've got a chance to get along. Yeah, and have a I was there. It really talked to me. We might just have a look, little look at it uh, because I, I know I saw you there and it, and it was tremendous. It's this rat look. You've got uh, the rats being released. You've got that grungy look. It's very sultry. It's very now. It's that sort of rubbish bin look. It's that homeless look. It's that sad, I'm buggered uh, sort of look. Um, what did you make of it, Chloe? You were obviously excited by it. I was. I thought it was really good. I thought the rebelliousness of it just drew me. Yeah. It was refreshing to see something so different after watching it. You know, yeah. they catch the rats all week. Well, they had little pellets. I don't know. They were sticking them through the. There can see a lot of rat you droppings know, on the catwalk. One of the yeah. girls trod on one of the rats and killed it. Yes, that can happen. That would be collateral damage. Yeah. Yeah. Was there polite applause in the crowd? There was. Yo, oh, way to go! They carried him off on a little stretcher and yeah. stuff. Now, yeah. we noticed you were reading a story about <laughs> bats. Have you ever had to walk down the runway with bats? No. With bats? No, I no. can't I say I think that I could have. be interesting, because yeah. apparently Roy was telling me before that bat dung is pretty, pretty... Oh, Lively. Oh, it's, it's very acidic. It'll go through your duco. I mean, uh, the, the visitors to Belgium should well be warned. Um, now, we had a poll on our program uh, last week, Chloe. Mm -hmm. It was a simple poll. It simply said, Australian Fashion Week is, and uh, the results of which were as follows. Uh, uh, the most popular ones, uh, suggesting it is a magnet for international glamour. 59% of people felt that, uh, clearly a majority. Now, we kept that poll going all week. And uh, by this afternoon, this is the way the poll looked. Makes us proud as punch, 2%. Is a magnet for international glamour, 24%. Uh, gets the blood hot in the trouser, 24%. <laughs> D, is a major embarrassment, 50%. Oh. Now, I think now, that's the classic case of the tall poppy syndrome. Beautifully put. Don't you, think oh, you mean like chopping down a tree? Should support Australian fashion. <laughs> yeah. It generates a lot of capital for Well, this look, I, I read in, uh, in uh, the Sunday papers yesterday that uh, Fashion Week internationally, overseas, the reportage isn't good. They said it was dull, that it was drab, that it was derivative. They hated the weather, they hated the look, they hated everything about it. Now, are these the whispers that are reaching you? Because it annoys no. me. <laughs> and we had the Premier, Bob Carr, Premier of New South Wales, on this program last week, yep. saying that Fashion Week brings in $50 million it to does. the, the economy of Australia. Of yeah. Now, mm -hmm. if we're being trashed overseas, mm. we can forget it. Yes. Forget yes. it. Now, what are you, what's know. your reading of it, well, Chloe? I don't know where you're getting your information. From the Sunday Telegraph or the, well, the Sydney Morning Herald? <laughs> One of those August That's newspapers. They don't newspaper. lie. <laughs> All right, the London Times said it was rubbish. <laughs> the New York Times said it was I rubbish. I think you're fibbing. Yes. Right. It could well be. It could well be. Look, one no. thing I was going to say was that, just on a personal note, you always arrive late for your events at yeah. Fashion Week. Uh, you know, uh, do you do this by design or is it just because you've had well, a hectic Well, it's very schedule? fashionable to be late. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> That's not yes. why I do it, though. No, no, I think because a lot of the times when you arrive on time, you end up just sitting around bored, waiting. bored to bored, tears. Yeah. Do you get nervous before <laughs> you step out through the curtain without your bra on? Oh, well, that kind of <laughs> That footage, yeah, what happened there was that they actually made a busty air for me and yeah. it didn't fit me, so I got... Typical well, Pushed on stage, right, you're on. Mm. And it, it happens. So uh, I really didn't have any say in it. But... I remember uh, years ago, uh, it was a, <laughs> a gussetless look. 
Uh, yeah, when you were a model, <laughs> when you used to model. Yes, and uh, there, were no, there were no swimwear. underpants. There were no that's underpants. Not really, my forte. And so it was a gussetless look without underpants. So <laughs> it, it, it is embarrassing when you've got to show your private bits to, yeah. the, to, the, to the public. But I always I'm tried sure to get into. I always well, tried though. to get into the mindset of selling the clothes. Mm -hmm. Is that how it is for you, Chloe? When you go out there? Yeah, I think so. You think I'm selling the clothes yep, here? Yep, pretty much. But no one like, ever looks as though they're having fun. Yeah, I know some girls look a bit like they want to be somewhere else. Somewhere else. Do, somewhere else. But I look Selling... like I'm having fun, don't I? <laughs> yeah, I suppose so. I, I don't so. think you did. Oh, no, really? you, look... <laughs> you look. You look bored. You looked as if you were wearing rubbish. You. Uh... <laughs> well, often they brief you before you go on as to what sort of feel they want. Yeah. What did they what? say to you? you look bored. My oh, clothes are right. rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, no, perfect. 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 Well, it worked. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's the message they're getting overseas. Yeah, it would be. Bored rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I think, no, I think you're being too harsh. We are, we are. Far too harsh. And we the parties. It. I love the party. I, yeah. I, I went to the Akira Izagawa party and, mm -hmm. uh, God, it was, <laughs> it was dull. Yeah. <laughs> Now, I saw you leaving as I was arriving. You found yeah. it dull, didn't you? Well, I fell asleep on the couch in a pool of my own drool, so I kind of had to get on. <laughs> like... <laughs> that can happen, though, Roy. <laughs> a, a pool of drool. Yeah. But, then it goes, but then you went to another party. Yeah. You, you went to the pavement magazine up. party. Yep. Wipe that up. was good. That was great. Then yeah. you went to McDonald's before going to bed. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to get in trouble, aren't I? <laughs> oh, it's all glamour. I'm yes, an yes. and everything. We shouldn't be talking about this. Yes. Now, look, before you go, we've got a couple of terrific things for you to take away. We've got these marvellous Girl Guide Biscuits. Yes, this is the dinner! Chocolate, chocolate. <laughs> and I'm there's two, two varieties. You've got your... I haven't your, uh... eaten since last week. Well, these are perfect for you, then. <laughs> uh, there's a couple of packets of those. I'm joking. Now... Are you getting uh, fat? Yeah. And, look, we've got two so. pairs of... Uh, what we call uh, Federation socks. <laughs> These are uh, so socks that celebrate the centenary of Federation that awesome. we're in at the moment. Uh, look, they're, they're two fabulous pairs. They're not the liveliest pairs, but uh, I don't know. <laughs> they look on the catwalk. But then people would probably be not looking at your feet. They might be looking elsewhere. elsewhere. Uh, <laughs> uh, of course, next time you go down the catwalk, we'd love Thank to you. wear the, uh, the signature of the dump. Uh, that's the flap and dunny. And this is a belt buckle. A lot of people have been asking us what it is. It's a belt buckle. And uh, it's a tremendous belt buckle. And uh, maybe next time, regardless of what you're wearing, you know, but be wise, just slip on a belt with this on the front of it. In the meantime, can you please thank Chloe Maxwell? Thank you. Turn off your silly sausage. Ah, here we come. Here we come. Right, introduce yourself to Josh. Josh has come down to play with us. Hi, I'm Yesterday Brent. Yesterday was... That's... Walk up and introduce yourself properly like a gentleman does. <laughs> oh, you're hopeless. Can Jake, Jake. <laughs> Football actually does play a very big social role. Right, One that keeps kids right. off the streets of these days, as we, we all realise that the world's not as great and friendly what it used to be. Keeps them out of mischief, for one thing, and socially, with the rules and regulations of a club life, um, I think they knuckle down to schoolwork better, which serves them better in the long life, and uh, through, through the sport, they, they really go a lot better in life at all, right through. You know, you do have your one or two stray, but I mean, that is life, isn't it? You know what will happen if you keep standing on them, I'll send you to sit, and sit over with your mum somewhere. No. Yeah. I tell you what, I reckon if they took your tally away from you, mate, you'd be lost. Way back when my eldest son, and I won't tell you how old he is now, uh, he started playing under nines, under tens. I decided I'd help the club out and start coaching. I've been doing it ever since, actually. It's a boy, good stuff, that's the way. That's it, now get your kick. Good lad, good lad, the skill level's coming up better. Come on, Josh, let's see your skills, come on. I spend probably uh, eating up to 40, 45 hours a week on football during the football season and probably about 50 hours a week at work. And other than that, like football administration, I probably attend two to three meetings a, a week after tea of a night and sit down and then I have work here, I'm here for Saturday, I'm here for Sunday. 
Uh, I do get Monday night off, which is uh, to sit out on the couch and just uh, vegetate night at home. He'll, be, he'll, he'll live at least till Monday. Just go and get Gloria to check it out for him. Probably over a period of 10 years, it probably cost me $10,000. And I don't mind. I think that uh, the lovely thing is you walk down the street now and you've coached someone 20 years ago and it's, uh, it's hello, Mr. Bell, how are you? And they've got a, a two or three year old kitty in tell themselves, you know, and, uh, and everybody sort of still stays and the, the feeling still stays of the, the friendship, the family ship that we like to think we've got here. Yes, Peter Bell there with the uh, Williamstown Seagulls under 11s. And um, he does put in some hours, doesn't he? But when you add up the, uh, what was it, 60 hours a week at uh, work and uh, 45 hours a week at football, which 105 hours a week, haven't done quite done well, the last. Well, only 168 hours in a week. <laughs> Look at that. And no, he's got to get a bit serious. of sleep, I suppose, every now and again. <laughs> every third day. Yeah. Look, coaches have never been under more stress. Uh, in rugby league, uh, we've had the incident uh, in the past week where Tim Sheens, the coach of the Far North Queensland Cowboys, has had to take stress leave. Uh, we've got a couple of sides that look as though they're in a bit of trouble with the season already, and we'd like to highlight those now. One is the Sydney Swans, and we pick up the play here Someone yesterday uh, from the Swans, up the big pack forms against Brisbane. Swans, Lachlan goes, oh, Lachlan goes for a kick, and then unfortunately gets a point, so he's very disappointed with himself. Here's Creswell running through the middle, a beautiful run, and then what does he do? He simply kicks the ball to a Brisbane opponent, and so that diffuses that. Here's a bloke with glad wrap wrapped all around his ankle. I'm not sure whether that's a modern technique or just something the club's dreamed up. The Pressure on the coach. There's a man under pressure. The one on the left there's the coach of the Sydney Swans, Rodney Eade. He's uh, and then we move on to the West Tigers. Here's Penrith, not not the greatest club in the world at the moment, but nonetheless uh, and. Uh, Beautiful kick Not there the from the Tigers. Uh, <laughs> nothing to do anything at all. There's a former player wrestling with a beard. And here's the Brains Trust, the Tigers' Brains Trust. Bar Lamb on the right and Jared McCracken on the left there. And they're under a lot of pressure as well. Roy, it's a difficult time for coaches because of the enormous pressure, the amount of money in the game, the, the players and the demands of players who often earn more than you. Um, you know, what puts coaches under most pressure in your mind? It's, it's inherently stressful, uh, isn't it, HG? Uh, you've got to motivate players and you've got, them, you've got to get them to, a, to, to get a skill level and to have the confidence to produce that skill out in the middle. Mm. But the problem is that, uh, that uh, you're not out there doing it. You can't do it for them. Right. And so there's that frustration of seeing, you know, what's got to happen, but it's not happening. Uh -huh. So you've got to badger them. You know, you, you can ask them to do it and then they don't. Right. You can be patient, ask them again to do it then they don't. Uh, you can get angry with them uh, and shout, will you do it? Uh, no. Will you do it? Well, I try. They get out there and they don't do it. <laughs> uh, you, can, uh, you, you can punish them. Uh, if you bloody well don't do it this time, uh, then it'll be, you know, eight times around the oval and bloody well, I'll do this uh, and I'll burn your car and I'll bloody bloody blah, blah. <laughs> They don't do it again. And what the most... And then, then, then you, can, you, you try psychology. Uh, listen, you go out there and if you uh, can do this for uh, me, listen, uh, if you can go out and do this for me, yeah, I, honestly, yeah. I bet you can't do ten tackles for me today. Uh, can you try that? <laughs> oh, okay. and down they go. Uh, and they don't. Uh, and then you resort to desperate means. Uh, you say, please do it for me! Uh, who? For me! Who are you? That's right. <laughs> they don't do it. And yet then that's when the stress comes. Oh, yeah. You've gone through every level, you've tried every trick in the book. Uh -huh. You know, you threaten to slaughter their families. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing will work. Yeah. And the weird thing is, is they don't realise they're not doing it. No, that's probably yeah. right. They, they can't see what you want. Yeah, what do you want us to do? Yeah. Win. Yeah. What? Yeah. Win. Right. What? Yeah. What? Okay, you've gone through all these steps. At the end of the week, you're still lost. How, do you, how, how does that stress express itself once you're away from trying to cajole players or telling them what you want done? The ten tackles. I mean, it's an old familiar story, yeah. isn't it? But then at home, when you, there's no one there to tell the ten tackles to, yeah. how yeah. do you feel? Well you, feel like, well, you feel like rubbish. Do you? There's nothing rubbish. you do. You're like a coiled spring. Are you? Are and you? that's when you get high blood pressure, mm -hmm. heart attacks. Heart attacks. I mean, you can die. It can kill you. Can it? Stress is the biggest killer in this country. Is it? Yes. Football stress is the biggest... Football stress is the biggest, <laughs> killer, <laughs> the biggest killer in this country. killer in Do this doctors country. know about that? Do the ambulance drivers here often you hear, where, 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 where are you going? I'm going down the footy club. Yeah, yeah. Where, where, where. <laughs> Coaches just can't. Well, it's more stressful than being a heart surgeon. Is it? Or a dentist. Mm -hmm. Or a police person. Mm -hmm. Or an ambulance person. Sports commentator. Sports commentator. Yeah. Fashion it's far more stressful than that. Is it? I reckon it is. Yeah. I mean, it'd be just as stressful as, as being a coach of a surgeon. 
Oh, right. Oh. Or a coach of an ambulance person. <laughs> or a coach of a dentist. You know, yeah. when you go and get that... Oh, yeah. go on. No, not there. Not there. Yeah. Now, you know what I mean? What it's the not being able to do it yourself. Yes. What can you do about it? What can you do about that stress? You know, punching bag in the back, you know, maybe chop down a tree. Uh, you know, have a hobby, get you away from thinking about the problems of, um, you know, idiot Smith not doing anything, yeah. not doing the things you tell them. You tell them once, they don't do it, they come back, yeah. idiot grin on idiot Smith, <laughs> you know. What can you do? I've what often, can you do? I've often found hobbies <laughs> useful. I'd say stamp collecting yeah. or coin collecting. Yeah. Some <laughs> A few magazines under the bed, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's, sort of thing. that's a hobby. <laughs> Something that gets your mind somewhere else.